Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to St. Andrews. So glad you are with us. My name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors, and we are gathered here today to worship the God who created us, who called us, who equips us, who gives us his unending love, and who is present in every moment. Isn't that good news? So no matter how you came in today, we're so glad that you are here to worship that kind of a God. And we are a church that is bent on loving our community and shaping the culture by equipping every generation to follow Jesus. So that means wherever you're starting from, you're welcome here. So I'm going to ask you to stand and take just a moment, say hello to somebody, greet them, and then let's join our voices in worship.
Remember this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. In this hope, we were saved. But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. So let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Be still before the Lord. Wait patiently for him. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. God, a hand of praise. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we praise your name. You are king. You are victorious. You have conquered sin and the grave. And Lord, we thank you for that, that we have confidence of our relationship with you and a hope both for today and the age to come. And we honor and we worship you because you are king you are conqueror, you are our savior, and you are the one who has set us free. Lord, we pray for those who do not yet know this this saving hope that you give us. Lord, may we be inspired to bring that good news forth to our world, to continue to be your agents in this kingdom as we bring your kingdom here on this earth as it is in heaven. Lord, I pray you stir within our hearts something yet today that as we discover more about you, more about this life, more about how we can become closer to being like Jesus, Lord, inspire in our hearts in a way that activates us to change, to transform, to humbly come before you and see all the goodness and the love and the hope you have to offer in exchange for our brokenness, our pain, and our suffering. And Lord, for those of us who need a touch from you today, who are who are in pain, who are suffering, who are crying out and standing in the gap for someone else. 
Lord, meet us here in this moment as we intercede and as we pray and as we invite your kingdom to fill even the dark corners of our hearts and the dark corners of our lives. Lord, may your kingdom be victorious into the depths of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated.
Amen. That is really, really good news. <laughs> really good news. Well, uh, at this point in our service, we are going to do something that is one of my favorite parts of when we gather together for worship. We are going to baptize uh, an infant this morning, so I'm going to ask the family to come forward. You guys can go ahead and make your way on up. And Tim Bauer, who is assisting me, one of our elders today, is going to join me as well. And one of the good things about Tim and I doing a baptism together is uh, he can look me in the eye. So I really like that. So come on up. Baptism is, is such an important part of the life of the church. And whenever we perform an infant baptism like this, we are proclaiming visibly one of the central tenets of our faith. And that's this, this is what we believe, that God in his grace moves toward us when we don't even know it. That he is acting on our, oh my goodness, wow, look at that. Okay, let me just stop what I'm saying and let's get this out of the way. Uh, would you tell us what your daughter's name is? Ella, Ella Cortez. Ella Sophia Cortez, and this is Alex and Christina, and uh, we are so proud today to be able to baptize little Ella. As I was saying, what God does is he moves, sorry, I just get distracted with something that cute, it's just amazing. Uh, what God does is he comes to you, to each and every one of us, before we can earn, deserve, even understand him, he gives his love, showers it on us. And he causes us to come alive. So what happens is when we do this baptism, we are not at this moment proclaiming Ella's salvation. What we are doing is claiming the promise of God that as this family presents her, we trust his faithfulness and his love to pursue little Ella every day of her life. And that one day in the future, we'll look back on this moment, a moment she'll have to even be told about because she won't remember and we'll recognize how uh, faithful God was to his promise. Do you agree with that? It's such good news. So I want to make just a couple of questions for you guys, some baptism vows that we do here, then I'm going to say a quick blessing, and then we will move into the actual baptism. Alex and Christina, do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And do you trust and rely on him to guide you, to give you wisdom, and to provide you the grace and mercy you need in this life? And do you intend for Ella to be Jesus' disciple, to obey his word, and to show his love? Yes. Congregation, I've got a question for you. Will you welcome Ella, Alex, and Christina into the life and worship of this church? Will you support this family with your love and with your prayers? And will you provide for their nurture in this community of faith? If so, say we will. We will. We will. Ella Sophia Cortez. For you, Jesus came into the world. It was for you that he lived and showed God's love. Ella, for you, he suffered the darkness of Calvary and cried, it is finished victoriously. He triumphed over death for you and rose in newness of life. For you, he ascended to reign. All this he did for you, Ella, though you do not know it yet. And so the scripture is fulfilled. We love because God first loved us. All right, let me see this bundle of joy. Oh my goodness. I mean, come on. Hold on, you guys got to see this too. Come on. Uh, Tim, if you'll help me out here. Uh, if you will pour the water. We baptize with water as a symbol of the Holy Spirit. There's nothing magical about it. There's no kind of special power in it. But because we are commanded to use this water, we then place it on her head as a symbol and a sign of being sealed in the covenant of grace. And so, Ella Sophia Cortez, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you for the life of Ella Sophia Cortez. Thank you that you created her with purpose, with meaning, with dignity, with your very image on her and in her. Father, we ask that throughout her life you would be close to her, that you would remind her in moments of your incredible love for her, that you would move in her life to let her experience the grace that you offer us so freely. 
And God, we look forward to the day when you will bring this little one to faith in Jesus Christ. Until that day comes, we trust you with everything that we have for her. And we believe that your promise will come true. We pray this, Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Ella Sophia Cortez. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Appreciate it, buddy. Thanks, guys. Well, as we continue in our service, I want to give you two announcements of things that are coming up. First of all, we are beginning a series on Proverbs and how some ancient wisdom from several thousand years ago still speaks to us today. So if you're interested in what Pastor Jason talks about today, you can join the Bible study right after service. Greg Chow is going to be diving in a little deeper into some of the concepts that we talk about today and both in the next couple weeks, so we encourage you to check that out. Secondly, I'm hosting beginning this Tuesday and the following three weeks after that, a special parent support group for twice gifted children. So if you're a parent with a child who has special needs or you know someone and want to just learn a little more of how we can support these families, come on Tuesday night. You can talk to me after service or email me, and I'd happily explain a little more about the details, but this is something that's near and dear to my heart, and I'm glad we're able to start helping these families in this kind of way. So with that, I want to invite the ushers to prepare as we begin for our time of tithe and offering, and I invite you to uh, encounter God in this way of worship as we continue to give to him uh, both today and in the coming days.
Well, I want to welcome uh, those joining us online to this service as well as we continue in this brand new series that we've started on Proverbs. It's called Life Hacks, and the whole point of what we're looking at in the next few weeks is how to make our lives better by putting into practice the principles that God has placed into the universe. And is there anybody in the room that would say, I actually just don't want my life to be better? I don't want to be better at doing this thing called life. I don't want to be a more joyful person or peaceful person. I don't want my relationships to be. Is there anybody that would say that, like, you're good with where you are right now? That's it? I didn't think so. Because of that, Proverbs gives us a treasure trove of how to find wisdom. My friend Steve last week opened this up by talking about the fact that wisdom is actually the fear of the Lord. And I want to put it a different way. Uh, Wisdom in the book of Proverbs is this. It's the skill for living well before God and others. To see someone who is wise biblically is a person that understands how to live the life God intended in a way that brings benefit not only to themselves but to those around them. It's called shalom. In the scriptures, the shalom of God is his intention for the world. It's flourishing and peace. It's abundance. It's everyone having what they need and being whole. And it's the way that things eventually will be when Christ returns. But for now, we live in the in-between where we have to work to gain skill to bring that shalom here. One of the things that we do in learning to be wise is to put into practice, actually, the principles that God gave us for the world. And the one that we're going to be looking at today is the principle of sowing and reaping. Now, thinking about this, uh, and recently having moved to California, there's one particular thing that's really kind of grabbed my imagination and intention about it. And and I want to show you a couple of images. Um, This is, well, you know what that is. It's a super bloom. These are the wildflowers that make California what is. Did you know that the Golden State is called that? I thought it was simply because of the sunsets. It's actually because of the golden poppies that are the state's flower. And they're everywhere. And these things sprout up because someone a long, long time ago planted these flowers. Research that I did this week told me that about 9,000 years ago, the original inhabitants of this area of Southern California were using, even eating, these flowers. They've been a part of our ecosystem and nature for a long time. Show another picture here. There's a couple of others, and you've seen these. Verbena and, and some of the poppies, just beautiful things that pop up. In fact, you can even see this. This is a, si- a satellite image. You can see it from space. Right here. Isn't that incredible? Now, we're enjoying the fruit of these flowers, their blooms, uh, what they provide for us in both beauty and inspiration and the way that they're used for pollinators to continue to bring goodness to the world. But we didn't plant these. In fact, I would submit to you that the one who planted those was God himself. In the soil of Southern California, long ago, he placed seeds and caused them to rise, and we're still reaping the benefits of his sowing those seeds. Isn't that incredible? In fact, that's what's true about sowing, what's different between sowing and planting. I was thinking about it this week. You know, planting, we'll take a plant and stick it in the ground, and then we hope to get something from it, maybe for it to multiply, to propagate something. But sowing is different. Sowing is taking a seed and intentionally placing it in the best possible soil so that it returns an exponential harvest. And this is a rule that God has placed into the universe. You've heard it said, maybe by your grandmother, well, you reap what you sow. I used to get told that a lot, especially when I was doing something wrong, getting in trouble, right? Often we hear this, you get the consequences of your action. That's just a part of life. And Proverbs has a lot to say about that. I want to show you just a few of the Proverbs that are placed in here. There's all kinds of uh, verses about it. Some of them speak to it directly using in sowing and reaping. And others, it's just the concept. But let me just give you a taste of what the writer of Proverbs says we should know for the skill of living by sowing and reaping. Proverbs 11:30 and 31 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and the one who is wise saves lives. That when you sow righteousness, you actually provide for people other than even yourself. And if the righteous receive their due on earth, how much more the ungodly and the sinner? 
you reap what you sow. Proverbs 11.18 says, A wicked person earns deceptive wages, but the one who sows righteousness reaps a sure reward. You reap what you sow. Proverbs 11, 24 and 25. One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper, and whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. You reap what you sow. Proverbs 14, 14. The faithless will be fully repaid for their ways, and the good rewarded for theirs. Proverbs 22, 8 says, Whoever sows injustice reaps calamity. And the rod that they wield in fury will be broken. And Proverbs 26, 27, an interesting one, says, Whoever digs a pit will fall into it. Someone rolls a stone, it'll roll back on them. Now, this is really vivid imagery. He's talking about someone who's creating a trap for someone else. You dig the pit, and in this days, then maybe you cover it over with sticks and leaves, and then you forget that you've dug the pit and you fall into it yourself. Or imagine the person that's pushing a big boulder up the edge of a cliff to drop it on an enemy. And as he pushes, the thing gets heavier and heavier the closer he gets to the top and one slip and it takes him out. The scripture is trying to tell us, God is trying to impress upon us, and it's not just in the Old Testament, it's all throughout the Bible, that we can expect, in fact, we can live our life based on the idea that we will reap what we sow. So so this is not, I don't think, a principle that I've got to convince you of. I think you believe it already. I think what I need to do with you for the next few minutes is not to try to get you to buy into this being valid. I think I need to get you to think about how you're going to live by it. This is where I go from preaching to meddling. So I'm going to get all up in your life and your business. And you're going to love it for the next few minutes. Here we go. A couple of parts of the ideas about the universal principle of sowing and reaping. Three things. First, we always reap what we sow. You don't put something into the ground, a certain kind of seed, and expect to get a different kind of plant. You reap what you sow. Uh, Hosea 10, 12 says this. I love it, this verse. Sow righteousness for yourselves and reap the fruit of unfailing love. Break up your unplowed ground, for it's time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers his righteousness on you. You sow acts of righteousness. We looked at that last week a little bit. Righteous, what is good, fair, peaceful. You perform actions. Put that activity into the soil of the life that God is giving you, and God will shower righteousness back on you. That's, that's a good, good news. Secondly, we reap more than we sow. Nobody puts a seed into the ground and expects to just one seed, one plant, right? The reason that we plant seeds is because we believe the plant's going to come with a, a, an exponential amount of fruit. So we always reap more than we sow. Jesus was talking about this in regard to himself one time. It was close to the end of his life, and he was telling the disciples, once again, I'm going to go die, and then I'm going to be raised from the dead. And they were so dense, they just couldn't get it. But, but you know, we wouldn't have been able to either, to be honest. Nobody had a concept for resurrection of the dead. But Jesus keeps saying, I'm going to go, the Son of Man is going to die. In fact, in John 12, 24, he said this. He says, unless a kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies in that ground, it produces many seeds. Now, he was talking about the fact that his death and resurrection would lead to the faith of all of us. That the, us uh, trusting in and finding salvation in his life, death, and resurrection would produce many who would also be resurrected from the grave one day. But the principle is the same. We always expect to get more than we sow. And then finally, we always reap later than we sow. There's this line that's been rolling around in my head all week as I thought about it. And it's this. Today is the child of yesterday but it's also the father of tomorrow. You and I are where we are based on the the harvest that we've received from seeds we sowed a long time ago. And some of us are living lives that are really, really painful because of some of the decisions we made to sow. And some people are living great lives because you made wise choices. It doesn't matter. Today is the child of yesterday. But here's the good news, and this is why we're going to now pivot and go away from grandma's trying to make me feel bad about everything I did wrong. No no offense to any of you out there who used that tactic before. 
to actually saying this is a tool we could leverage. If you really get this, you can begin to sow seeds today that will give you the life that you want to have tomorrow. And that is really, really encouraging. The seeds that we plant today determine the crops we get tomorrow. The choices that we make today determine the choices that are available to us tomorrow. The things we focus our minds on today feed the thoughts we will have tomorrow. The friendships we nurture today are the ones that will give us life tomorrow. The questions we ask today determine the answers we'll receive tomorrow. And the habits we grow today determine the life we'll have tomorrow. So there's a whole lot riding on what you do in the next 20 minutes with the words that I'm about to give you. So I'm going to ask you to consider this. The scripture talks about things that we should plant or sow, uh, places that we should sow, and the amount, the quantity that we should sow. And all of them are intentional in creating the life that we get in the harvest. So I want to get you to consider with me three areas. Your mind, your money, and moments. What are we sowing in our minds? Where are we sowing with our money? And what are we doing with our moments? What kind of seeds are we sowing in there? What kind of harvest are we getting? And I'll explain that more as we go. First of all, the mind. Uh, In uh, agriculture, there are three different ways that you sow seed, at least three. But I pulled this from the Mitsubishi Agriculture uh, Owner's Manual for uh, crop sower here, and so I think it's pretty valid. Three different ways. First is broadcast seeding. This is when you take a bunch of seed, and some of you do this in your yards, and you walk around, you throw as much of it out there as you possibly can. You want to get an abundance of seed out because you know that some of it's going to take and some of it's not, and you just do everything you can to cover the area with seed. The second way is called point seeding. And this is where you strategically take seed and you plant it in the best possible soil for the return, where you're guaranteed as much as is possible to get the harvest that you want. And then finally is something called stripe or strip seeding, and that's where you dig a trench, you follow this one path, this one area, and you dump a lot of seed along the way. So you got the image? Let me show you how it works first, the uh, idea of sowing into your mind. This is the idea of broadcast seeding. How many of you know that culture is constantly trying to tell you what thoughts you should think. Every moment of every day, you are being bombarded with the thoughts that somebody wants to sow in your mind. Uh, A couple years ago, there was a really good docudrama on Netflix called The Social Dilemma. Any of you see it? It's talking all about uh, social media and how it works with us. And there's there's a funny uh, uh, thing that happens, this dynamic. Many of us, we believe... That you've been, you've been working with you know, scrolling you know, late at night or scrolling early in the morning on your social media feed, just looking at the stuff that pops up, just kind of thinking you're a blank slate. And all of a sudden you think about shoes or you tell your grandkids uh, about shoes and the next thing happens is an ad pops up for shoes, right? You said Adidas and suddenly Adidas is prominently displayed on your little device. And you think what happened is they're listening to you. Well, that's, that's actually kind of true in some ways. But what's even more true is not that someone somewhere out there is listening to your, your conversations and display the ad. It's even worse than that. Because what the social dilemma showed us by some of the creators of social media said that actually moments before that, they planted the seed in your mind to think about shoes and then delivered the answer for the thing that you were thinking about. See, there is a battle for our minds to determine someone's going to win. Who is planting the seeds in your mind? And you and I get to choose who it is. But if you simply just let life happen to you, simply stay reactive and passive, I promise you won't win. So we've got to take control. So how do you sow the right seeds into your mind? Well, let me tell you how uh, this works so powerfully. How many of you know that if you wake up in the morning and the first thing you do is either open up that phone or you turn on the TV or you grab the newspaper and you start reading, that you begin to feel despair, anxiety, fear, hopelessness. It just starts to spring up because that's what sells. 
And so someone is trying to plant in your mind those thoughts for the day. I guarantee you if that's how you begin every day, by 2, 3 o'clock, you are so focused on that way of thinking that you're reaping the harvest of those seeds that were sown. But what if you start the day by putting thoughts in that you want to think about? The thoughts that bring not anxiety, but peace. The thoughts that bring not hopelessness, but hope. Not despair, but confidence. This is why beginning with the scripture every day is so important. Let God be the first word in. And then, like a good broadcast cedar, don't just start with one five-minute time in the morning, grab your Oswald Chambers, and you're out the door. Like, you and I, we got to think about how do we continue all day long to sow the right seeds of thought in. Because if you've been sowing seeds of covetousness or jealousy as you look around at the other stuff people have, you're going to reap a harvest of greed. You're going to find that, that you want more and more. Conversely, if you sow seeds of contentment and gratitude for what God has done, you get freed up from that. So what kind of seeds are you going to sow? Where are you going to place in the soil of your mind the right thoughts? Philippians 4, 8 and 9 says this. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, Whatever is pure and right, lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. And you've heard this before. Paul wrote Philippians from jail. Of anybody, he could have woken up every day and started out thinking of all the worst that could happen. And instead, from that jail cell, he writes across the centuries to you and to me, and he says, focus your mind on what's pure, lovely, noble, right, Don't lose the battle for your mind. Sow the right seeds. It's it's interesting. I think sometimes we act as if uh, uh, we are just simply out of control or we are unable to control the thoughts that we have. And I'll be really honest. I I struggle with this one too. I'm the kind of person that's always thinking long-term strategy, like let's play out all the scenarios So if something is about to happen, I'm going to go, what's the worst that could happen? What's maybe the best, but probably it's going to be more the worst? Like, it's easy for me to get caught up in that doomsday thinking. Anybody else like that? Which is just such a waste of our energy, right? Such a waste of time. Uh, But think, your mind is like a runway. And the thoughts that come to you are like planes. And you don't have to let every plane land on your runway. Do you know this? You don't have to allow the thought to stay. You're the air traffic controller. I don't care if Maverick is calling for a flyby. You say no. <laughs> you're going to think about that the rest of the day. I can hear the music right now. It's, it's really going good. Right? You are in control. Now, some of us feel like we don't have control because we're in a pattern maybe of anxious thoughts or fearful thoughts, and there are things that happen to our biology and our chemistry that cause that to be more true. If that's the case, you still can control it. Get a good therapist. Find a friend. Begin to fill your mind up with the Word of God and the, the truth of God and not allow your runway to get littered with planes that shouldn't land there. So what are you sowing into your mind? Second. You should think about your money. So many times in the scripture, our money is talked about as seed. That you and I get to choose where we're going to sow it. And, and this is an area that I know for every single one of us, it's a constant battle because money represents control and security and opportunity. And, and it also reminds us we feel like we've worked so hard and we've earned and deserved it. All that stuff is great, except that the Bible reminds us that everything we have is a gift from God, including your ability to work and make money. So like it's all his, right? We agree with this, at least intellectually. And what he says is, you cannot mess up by investing in my kingdom, It's just impossible. I used to sell investments for a living. There was never an investment like investing in the kingdom of God. It is guaranteed to bring fruit. Even if with the little faith that you and I have, and sometimes we plant that seed, we sow it deep into the ground, and then we're like, gosh, I don't see the return. In the kingdom of God, you always get a future return. Always. It's it's the most peculiar thing. And what's even better about the way that we sow seeds of money is that when we give that to the kingdom, God gives us the guaranteed future 
as we fund the gospel mission, as we choose to allow uh, great organizations and great missionaries and great churches like this one to use the wealth that God has given to us, it always brings a harvest. God's not going to let that go to waste. He maximizes the seed and the planting. So I think it's kind of like that picture of point seeding. Like choosing strategically where you're going to put your seed. And I think that the church, the local church, is one of the best places that you should invest in. You should be sowing seeds. I know that so many of you are super generous. And you look at the end of your year and you decide where it's going to go. And that's so good. We are grateful here at this church. We have no debt and we have an incredible amount of ministry that happens. But I want to ask every single one of you to consider today, maybe, to begin sowing consistently not based on what you have when the year's over, but consistently and regularly right now. And, and that you would begin to invest into the kingdom of God that St. Andrews is working to bring here. But wherever you do that, just know that you're going to receive not only the harvest in the future, but then God gives blessing to us now. And here's the problem. We all get a little worried. Like I can see the whole room is like kind of shifting around when I started talking about money. It's really, you should see this view that I have. I get it. I get it. Nobody likes this. It's but when you understand the principle of sowing and reaping and when you begin to choose to intentionally place what God has given you as a conduit of blessing for others, it sets you free. And I, some of us have fallen for this idea that like if I give God 100 bucks, he gives me back 200, the prosperity gospel, all that stuff. I'm not talking about that. But what I do believe to be absolutely true is to take God at his word, that not only will he give the harvest in the future, he returns to us blessing of peace. Sometimes it's the way he shows up in your life right now. You just can't miss by sowing seed into the kingdom. And so I'd love to ask you to consider that here. But now I'm going to go even further because the money idea is hard enough, but this one really might push you, okay? So do whatever you got to do. Loosen up a little bit. There's something about the way that we invest, we sow seeds into the moments of our life that matter, into our relationships. And, and this time of year for me, is, it's really got me thinking about this. Um, yesterday during the Saturday night service, uh, my wife's family is super celebrating because my sister-in-law brought a newborn baby into the world yesterday afternoon, right? So I'm in worship. This is happening six o'clock, brand new baby. And I got to thinking back about something that, um, that, that's really been impactful for me. So John, if, if you would bring me this up, this, um, it's a beautiful image. This is a jar of... 936 marbles. Uh, this is how many weeks, one marble for each week, that parents have with a child from the day they're born until they turn 18 and leave the house. Let's sit right there. So, what does this look like? A lot or a little? Kind of depends on where you are, right? For you guys right now, this feels like a lot, doesn't it? Because the days seem like they last for 78 hours. <laughs> it's tough. 936 weeks, that's what we got. That's what my sister-in-law, Catherine, is now looking at for the next 18 years of her life. And I want you to think about each of those weeks as an opportunity to create a moment. See, one of the reasons that this looks like a lot to us is, is because of, uh, well, perspective. This is all we see, but let me show you uh, this. So in my world, uh, this is 463 marbles. This is how many weeks I have left with my youngest child, Charlotte. Just turned nine this summer. Look at that. Look how much is gone. And sometimes the pressure that we put on ourselves is that every moment has to be filled. We gotta have the right thing to say. We gotta do it right every moment. We gotta constantly be on top of our game. And for young parents, some of you know this, it is exhausting. You feel like I messed up yesterday. I, I, I'm in trouble now. Oh, I've lost the opportunity. Look at this. You got a lot of opportunities. If each of us said, and just in parenting right now, once a week, we're going to create a moment where we sow into our kids trust and communication and love and a thought about God. One time a week, you got a lot of options. But, but here's the, the problem. So this is, uh, this is how many weeks I have left with my middle child. Uh, her name's Eden. 
Got 98 left. She's turned 16. Two years left of school. And I can't believe that. But I've got 98 more weeks of opportunities to create a moment for her. To sow into her what I want to see. And I don't know about you, but this is not meant to make you feel badly or discouraged. It's actually meant to motivate. Because actually where I'm sitting right now is my oldest daughter, Savannah. I got three weeks left. Three weeks before, you know, college starts. And it's not like the relationship is over. But the opportunity to sow the things that I want has gotten so small. So maybe you're a parent, and and this makes a ton of sense to you right now. And I want you to consider how do you sow into the moments of that relationship in a way that's going to harvest, bring a harvest that you want to reap. But maybe it's not for a parent. Maybe you're a grandparent, or you don't have kids yet, and you've got relationships you need to think about. Consider this with your marriage. I mean, this is 18 years worth. How many of you who are married hope you get another 18 years with your spouse? Every hand should be in the air right now. What is the, I mean, I get, I've had those weeks too where I'm, but like, yes, you got to have hope. What if you had 963 opportunities to sow into your marriage what you want? You want trust? You sow trustworthiness. You want good communication? You sow that. You want peace? I tell you what you don't plant is anger. But you got all this opportunity. What if you looked at the moments of your life and the relationships that matter and you sowed what was necessary and it is a principle that doesn't get violated? And so I'm just thinking maybe, maybe this week you could just make a list of a couple of these things. Where do you need to sow into your mind the thoughts that you want to reap tomorrow? Where Do you need to begin to sow your money with intentionality? And is this the place that you could begin? Where in your relationships, which ones do you need to get intentional? It's like that striped seeding. It's that trench that was dug and you get as many seeds in there as you can. And we all become very sober and intentional about how much time we have left. Here's the thing with sowing and reaping. You do it prayerfully. I love this. In James, James is like the New Testament version of Proverbs, right? It's very, very similar to that. And and James, James 1, he says, if any of you lacks wisdom, ask God and he will give it generously. Like a little seed of request for wisdom and God will give generously. If you begin to sow seeds, you need to start prayerfully. God, where do you want me to do this? What words do you want me to speak to my spouse? What words does my friend need to hear? How do I create this space? God will give it to you. We sow seeds prayerfully. Secondly, we begin to sow them intentionally. We don't just react and respond to life. You choose. Third, we sow consistently. There's no farmer that throws a seed out there and then is like, well, hope and a prayer. I mean, hope and a prayer is a good thing to have. Don't get me wrong. It's just not a great strategy for life. And then we sow seeds expectantly. What do you think would happen if you began looking at your life with this much intentionality and you started to believe God is going to do something with this moment? God is going to bring a harvest that's more than what I sowed. It's exponentially more. Do you think your hope might rise? Your your peace level might rise? Your trust might rise? Just remember this other principle in 2 Corinthians 9 that Paul said, When you think about the harvest that you want, the one who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. But to the one who sows generously, they'll reap generously. So I got this question to consider. Why don't you decide where you'll sow your best? Decide that this week. And as a way, because I'm a sucker for like tokens, uh, when you walk out the door, we got some wildflower seeds for you. Uh, And I was just thinking maybe you'd take it and you'd put it in a pot or you'd drop it in your backyard or you'd go somewhere in spring and let this be a physical, tangible reminder of what you're choosing to do. So grab these on your way out. 
And remember what that view from the air looked like of those wildflowers. What God can do over time. Do you know that some of those seeds can stay ungerminated for 70 years? But eventually, the right conditions come up. And it blows your mind. Same can be true in your life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this truth. Thank you for the fact not only that you put a principle into the universe like this, but then you showed us over and over and over again through your scriptures exactly how we could leverage it for our greatest joy and the greatest good of the kingdom. And the only thing that I think we're missing, God, because you said you'd provide everything else, you'd give us energy, you'd give us wisdom, you'd give us time, you've placed us in settings and relationships and contexts that you particularly chose so that we could have the impact you want. All we need is courage. So God, I ask that for my friends and for me that you would give us courage to sow intentionally, expectantly, consistently, and prayerfully into the places that you'd have us. We know that you are the God of the great harvest, and so we trust that. But I ask that you would move in us now and give us the wisdom from above to show us exactly what's needed and how to do it. We trust you. Jesus, we thank you that because of your life and death and resurrection, we even have the ability to do this because you've saved us and rescued us. And we ask that you would be powerfully present in our lives this week. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. As we seek to sow intentionally for our hymn of dedication, we were led to these words by a 12th century priest by the name of Francis of Assisi. And this particular prayer is known as the Prayer of St. Francis. It's an encouraging and uplifting prayer that teaches us to live like Jesus Christ and to serve those around us, putting other needs first. And so we um, are going to sing this to a Welsh tune called O Wally Wally. And Sam here is going to lead the first verse for us. And we encourage you to sing uh, the rest of the verses as we seek to live out these words this week. I invite you to stand. Let's sing together.
Amen. Uh, a couple of things. Um, if you would like someone to sow a seed of prayer into your life, as soon as we're done, to my right, we've got leaders here at the prayer room that would love to talk and help support you through whatever it is that you might be going through, whether high or low, good or bad, that's what we're here for, because we are this community of faith that's learning how to live and love together. And so because of that, I'd love to invite you afterwards, the next step area, if you're not yet connected, that's where you'll find all the info you need about how to take a step and become a part of this place called St. Andrews. And lastly, if uh, you're a young adult or if you've got one in your life that could use investing, kind of sowing some seeds into moments that matter, our young adults are taking a trip to Zion in just a few weeks. We'd love to invite uh, you or someone that you know to sign up for that. It's a great way to start to begin uh, to make those kind of friendships that will last for the rest of your life. And so we invite you into that as well. Last word for you. The law of sowing and reaping is undeniable. It's unstoppable. It's one of the most powerful in the world. There's only one force that overrides it. You know what it is? It's grace. Grace is when God can take even the things that we've done, the seeds that we've sown, and say, I hear you, but I have a better plan. And if you'd like to know more about that grace and how to receive it through Christ Jesus, we'd love to invite you as well to come and talk to one of us. That is the good news that we have as followers of him. So receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Have a great week, St. Andrews.